this thing on? When we explain things, we can really mess things up by not explaining things at the right level. And when we make that mistake, that's an ecological fallacy. Let's get into it. So what is an ecological fallacy? An ecological fallacy is basically when we have information about a group of people and we use that information to draw a conclusion about an individual who happens to be in that group. In sociology, we can study things at different levels. You know, we can look at the society, we can look at nations, we can look at cultures, we can look at individuals, you know, and these are all different levels of analysis. And an ecological fallacy is when we mix these levels up. So here's a definition of an ecological fallacy. It's basically based on group level data. We cannot make specific statements about the individuals that form these groups. So if let's say, so if you see me wearing glasses and uh, it would be a mistake to then think that I'm very intelligent because you know from elsewhere that people who wear glasses are more intelligent. When you observe something about a particular group that does not apply to the individual. A special case of the ecological fallacy is what we call Simpson's paradox. And this one is not named after the Simpsons, you know, very cool show, but it is named after Edward Simpson, a statistician. It's a special case of an ecological fallacy. Basically, it's a phenomena in statistics in which a trend appears in several different groups of data, but the trend disappears or even reverses when these groups are combined. And that can have far-reaching implications. Let me jump into it. So there's an example about illiteracy. Illiteracy is how many people cannot read. And there's an older paper by Robinson, you know, published in the American Sociological Review. And in that paper, Robinson looked at the different states in the United States and looked at how many people cannot read in that state. You know, that's the illiteracy rate. But Robinson also looked at the proportion of the population born outside of the US. So how many people in each of those states are immigrants? How many people come from abroad? And when you take these two pieces of information, you know, for each state, you get like two numbers, like how many people cannot read and how many people are from abroad. And when you see these two numbers and you look at it over all the states in the United States, Robinson found a negative correlation. Negative correlation minus 0.53. That means like the one goes up, the other one goes down. So in this case, the number of immigrants goes up, the illiteracy rate goes down. So basically, it seems that in states with lots of immigrants, illiteracy was low. But now it gets interesting. So when looking at individuals, yeah, so not at states, but at actual individuals, there is a correlation between being a migrant and being illiterate, and that correlation is positive, meaning the two things go up, meaning an immigrant is more likely to be illiterate, so not be able to read, than somebody who was not an immigrant back in the days. So it seems that immigrants were, on average, more illiterate than native citizens in the US. That's really strange. How can that be? So at the state level, we have a negative correlation, like the number of immigrants goes up and the people that cannot read goes down uh, at the state level. But at the individual level, we have a positive correlation between these two things. So when somebody is an immigrant, there's a higher chance that that person cannot read. That's really odd. So what is going on? So it seems that immigrants are more illiterate than Americans. At the same time, illiteracy is higher in states where fewer immigrants live. And maybe you already see where the fallacy is coming from. And maybe you can see where the fallacy is coming from. So it's not because immigrants come to a state and those immigrants can read more, you know, and that's why the illiteracy rate goes down in that state. No, it's actually works in a slightly different way. So immigrants tend to settle in states where Americans were more literate to begin with. So immigrants tended to go to, let's say, New York, and people were more likely to read in New York anyway to begin with. So the reason why states with fewer immigrants are more illiterate was not because of immigrants, but because of the Americans who already lived there. When we look at this in a more conceptual way, you know, like we have a correlation at the macro or ecological level, you know, states with immigrants and or the percentage of immigrants in the state and the literacy rate in that state, that's a correlation at the macro level. But what we shouldn't do is confuse it with a correlation at the micro level, which is being immigrant and the ability to read or not to read. 
And so these things happen at different levels. And as I showed you, they can go in completely different directions. Let me talk about another example, a death penalty. You know, it's very important because there you actually see how far reaching the implications of an ecological fallacy can be. So especially in days where we really want to look closer into racial discrimination that is unfortunately still going on. So here I'm talking about a paper by Radilet published in the American Sociological Review as well. And what Radilet did looked at um, homicides, you know, like murder, somebody got killed and there was, a, there was an offender, it was like clear that person killed that person, was convicted. And now the question was, did that convicted felon receive the death penalty Yes or no? So Radelet used data from Florida, you know, from the 1970s, different counties, and this is the data that is being displayed here right now. And what Radelet did is kind of separate that information out for whether the offender or the defendant, you know, that's the person, that's the murderer, whether the murderer was white or black. And did the murderer receive the death penalty? Yes or no? So what we see here, you know, we see yeses and noes for the two races, whites and blacks. And, uh, you know, when we look at the number of whites that did get the death penalty, that's basically 19. Let's go ahead. It's 19 divided by, and now the whole thing, which is 141 plus 19. So 19 divided by 160, that gives you 11.8. So that basically says that 11.8% of the white murderers were sent to death, receive the death penalty. Okay, let's do the same thing for the blacks. So here we have, let's look at the black offenders. So here 17 received the death penalty and 149 did not receive the death penalty. So if we calculate again, the percentage of how many blacks did get the death penalty were sentenced to death, we have 17 divided by 149 plus 17. And that kind of is 117 divided by 166. And that is, 10.2 percent so it looks so it looks when we just compare these two percentages with each other that white offenders you know white murderers get sentenced to death more often than black murderers hmm. now let's now let's do a bit of magic now i'm separating this information further out depending on what race the victim was. So now we're only looking at the cases where the person who got killed in the first instance was white, right? So now the victim was white, and now we look at, again, like murderers being white and black, and how many of those get sentenced death and how many did not. And when we now calculate the rate of white offenders who get sentenced to death for having killed a white person, a white victim, we end up with 12.5. But when we now look at the percentage for black offenders who killed a white victim, so the victim is white, we only look at those cases, so a black offender, a black murderer, we have 11 divided by 52 plus 11, is like 17.5% of the blacks get sentenced to death. So now it seems that blacks get sentenced to death more often than whites. The thing gets even more bizarre because now I'm looking at the cases where the victim is black, right? So now we don't look at the cases where a white person was killed. We only look at the cases where a black person got killed. And again, for for this subset of, of murders that happened, we look at the defendant's race. So like, the, was the murderer white or black? And when we now look at the cases where a white person killed a black victim. There was nobody of those got sentenced to death. But nine white offenders were not sentenced to death. So we have like a rate of 0%. 0% of the whites who killed a black person got sentenced to death. When we now look at the black offenders, we have six out of 97 plus six, you know, 103. So six out of 103 get sentenced to death. So we have 5.8% of the cases that get sentenced to death. So what does it show us? First of all, it shows us one really sad thing that is that the race of the victim seemed to have mattered for whether the murderer gets sentenced to death or not. Yeah? So killing a white person led much more often 
to the death penalty for the murderer than killing a black person. But then there's another thing that kind of shows up in this, and that's sort of when we kind of look at these separate groups for white victims, it suddenly seems that blacks get sentenced more often to death, right, here. For black victims, it also seems that blacks get sentenced more often to death. But when we look at the whole data, you combine it all together, and that was the first table that I showed you, wow, it looks as if whites get sentenced to death more often. So how can that be? That is a paradox. Okay, so what's going on? So what's going on? Well, it seems that whites get sentenced to death more often than blacks, but when splitting the data up according to the race of the victim, you know, in both cases, blacks get sentenced to death more often than whites. How can that be? Well, as it turns out, whites back in the days tended to kill other whites, and killing whites was more likely to result in the death penalty than killing blacks. So blacks were more likely to kill black people and uh, killing a black person at the day didn't lead as often to the death penalty as killing a white person. And that kind of was behind this paradox. Okay, so much about the ecological fallacy. Essentially it is when you mix things up at different levels and, and then draw conclusions from the overall information that you have on particular individuals. But I have a little video on um, the ecological fallacy, which probably explains this much better than I can. We often evaluate the success of medical treatments or social programs by how much of the population they help, but this can be a problem. Like suppose we're treating a disease that afflicts both people and cats, and among one cat and four people we treat, the cat and one person recover and three people die. And of four cats and one person we don't treat, three of the cats recover while one cat and the person die. In the real world, these numbers might be more like 300 and 100 or whatever, but we'll keep them small so they're easier to keep track of. So in our sample, 100% of treated cats survive while only 75% of untreated cats do, and 25% of treated humans survive while 0% of untreated humans do. Which makes it seem like the treatment improves chances of recovery, except that if we aggregate the data, among all people and cats treated, only 40% survive, while among all people and cats left on their own, 60% recover. Which makes it seem like the treatment reduces the chances of recovery. So which is it? This is an illustration of Simpson's paradox, a statistical paradox where it's possible to draw two opposite conclusions from the same data depending on how you divide things up. And statistics alone can't help us solve it. We have to go outside statistics and understand the causality involved in the situation at hand. For example, if we know that humans get the disease more seriously and are therefore more likely to be prescribed treatment, then it can make sense that fewer individuals that get treated survive, even if the treatment increases the chances of recovery, since the individuals that got treated were more likely to die in the first place. On the other hand, if we were to know that humans, regardless of how sick they are, are more likely to get treated than cats because no one wants to pay for kitty healthcare, then the fact that 4 out of 5 humans died while only 1 in 5 cats died suggests that indeed the treatment may be a bad choice. So if you're doing a controlled experiment, you need to make sure to not let anything causally related to the experiment influence who you apply your treatments to. And if you have an uncontrolled experiment, you have to be able to take those outside influences into account. As a more tangible example, Wisconsin has repeatedly had higher overall 8th grade standardized test scores than Texas, so you might think Wisconsin is doing a better job. However, when broken down by race, which via entrenched socioeconomic differences is a major factor in standardized test scores, Texas students performed better than Wisconsin students on all fronts. Black Texas students scored higher than black Wisconsin students, and likewise with Hispanic and white students. The difference in the overall ranking is because Wisconsin has proportionally far fewer black and Hispanic students and proportionally more white students than Texas. So the takeaway certainly shouldn't be that Wisconsin has better education than Texas, just that it has proportionally more socioeconomically advantaged students. So understanding the underlying causal context of statistics can have huge public implications. In some situations, there's also a nice graphical way to picture Simpson's paradox, as two separate trends that each go one way, but the overall trend between the populations goes the other way. Like maybe more money makes people sadder, and more money makes cats sadder. But if cats are both much happier and richer than people to start with, the overall trend appears incorrectly to be that more money makes you happier. In this case, being a cat makes you happier, but also happens to correlate with having more money. And you could also misinterpret this graph to show that overall, more 
money makes you a cat, which I think helps illustrate very well the ability to lie or reach incorrect conclusions by blindly using statistics without context. Of course, this is not to say that statistics are always going to be paradoxical or confusing. It's quite possible that everything will just make sense from the get-go. Like if people and cats both get sadder when you give them more money, and cats are both poorer and happier than people, then the overall trend is no longer paradoxical. More money equals more sadness. But it's important to be aware that paradoxes like Simpsons are possible, and we often need more context to understand what a statistic actually means.